following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. It's time for Volatility Views, the premier radio program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll dive into the world of volatility, how to manage it, profitable strategies, and how to avoid the pitfalls of trading volatility. If it involves volatility, you'll find it on Volatility Views. And now, the Volatility Exchange is proud to present your hosts, Mark Longo and Don Schlesinger. Welcome back to Volatility Views, your weekly source for all things volatility related. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com as well as the Options Insider Radio Network. And as you may have been able to tell already, my voice is a little bit hoarse. And that's because I wore it out thoroughly at our big Options Insider Unusual Activity Forum a couple of days ago. I want to, of course, thank all of you who I met in person at the event. A lot of you came up to me and said you loved Vol Views. Uh, so it was great to really interact with you guys in person. People flying in from Dallas and California and uh, Denver. It was, it was really a, a great turnout from a great group of people who were really motivated and interested in uh, in options and all the ancillary aspects of them. So it was it was a great, uh, great crowd. And I want to thank all of you again personally here on the show for all of you who made it out. And if you couldn't make it, you couldn't join us, you couldn't make it to Chicago this week, I understand. It's, a, it's hard to get out here. Uh, but don't worry because we're going to put together a nice post-event package and make that available in some way, shape, or form on our site in a couple of weeks once we get it all cut together. It's going to have the audio. It's going to have the webinar with the visuals. It's going to have video. It's going to have video interviews that we exclusively did on the site with all of our presenters. So a lot of great stuff we're going to be offering there after after the event. So great, great stuff. And of course, I am joined today by another person who couldn't make it in, but it would have been great to have you there as well. Good old Don Schlesinger from the Volatility Exchange. Don, welcome back to the show, sir. I'm sorry I missed it. It sounded terrific and looks like you uh, talked yourself hoarse, but uh, for a worthy cause. And uh, it, it sounded like a great event. And those are exciting follow ups that you're going to do to uh, uh, get all the information out to listeners. So congratulations. And uh, maybe next time I'll find a way to be a part of it. Now, obviously, I do a little talking for a living, so if I blew my voice out, you know it was an epic extravaganza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, interesting stuff. We'll be joined a little bit later by good old Andrew Giovinazzi from Option Pit, but Don and I couldn't wait. We're champing at the old bit to get started, so we're going to dive right into the volatility review. It's time for the volatility review. All right, and welcome to the Volatility Review. This is, of course, a portion of the program where we look back on the week that was from a volatility perspective. We're going to kick things off. We'll, we'll flip it around a little bit. A lot of times we like to start with the old VIX S&P side of the equation. Let's turn it on its head this week, Don, and let's start over there in NASDAQ realm. What, if anything, really caught your eye over there in NASDAQ vol land over the past week? Yeah, quite a dip, actually. We've had uh, realized volatility... Uh if you want to call it plummet, when you get to these levels and you're, you're only at the 10, 11, 12 range and you, you drop uh, three or four points, that's a, that's a considerable percentage of the entire number. So uh, we are actually at a point now where NASDAQ is, uh, is 12, historical volatility, 12.06. Uh, S&P even lower at 10, 10.1. And naturally, for, for realized volatility, these are extraordinarily low levels. But what, what I find interesting is when you, you take a look at uh, the entire year and, and you go back, you know, you figure, gee, we're at a 10 handle now for 21-day historical S&P volatility or 12 
for NASDAQ, which relatively speaking is even more shocking and, and even lower still because historically NASDAQ is a bigger number than S&P. You say, well, gee, you know, if I went back farther, I surely would have higher numbers. And the fact of the matter is you do, but, but only mildly so. So going back to the three-month historical volatility, S&P is 11.9. And NASDAQ is 13.3, nothing to get excited about. And then you say, well, gee, if I go back a year, you know, it must be higher than that. Uh, S&P is 12.8. That's the entire 12 months worth of historical data for the S&P. And, and NASDAQ is a, a kind of a shockingly low 15.4. And, and so you're, you're looking at what has come to be an entire year's worth of this reasonably low volatility regime. And, you know, if I must say so, not giving myself credit, but Mark and I, Mark Sebastian and I both said quite some time ago when we were looking at these low numbers that, you know, folks, you better get used to it because uh, uh, we remember days when, when this was the norm. And all of you guys that have come in recently and looking at 25 VIX and, you know, thinking that you, you've got to be in, in the mid-20s for volatility, know that that wasn't always the case and that we just very well may be entering into a regime of volatility that's considerably lower than some of our newcomers to these markets have ever experienced. And uh, here we are you know, a last year's worth of data with NASDAQ at 15.4 and S&P at 12.8. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, it certainly has been just a, a crazy period. And you're right. You and Mark really did a jump out ahead of that trend to say, hey, we're probably settling into a new vol regime here. The, the question is, of course, how long will that regime last? And that's what we're all kind of mulling over and pondering right now. And we are joined now by good old Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. And Andrew, what did you see? What caught your eye over the past week from an S&P vol, a VIX perspective? I think the the biggest thing for us, like watch, watching the VIX is like kind of how stubborn the May uh, future premium was. It never really drifted below a dollar. I thought it would come in a little bit. It stayed about 125 or 130. And it just, it never really did. So we had, um, you know, the VIX cash kind of just bobbed around in a tight range, but the future premium really never left. So, of course, it made us kind of getting some put sales off and the VXX and stuff like that uh, harder because uh, we got no future compression, which uh, we finally actually getting a little of it today. But it set up some, you know, I think some decent uh, plays uh, going into Monday and Tuesday, which actually we're already starting to unwind or we've unwound most of them already. But yeah, that was the most, I think the most interesting thing was that, and we have a June future premium, that's two and a half bucks over as well. And June will be the front month on Wednesday. So I just, I think the market is, is keeping a uh, relatively high future premiums because I, I think obviously they just don't believe the volatility can stay this low. So, and I, we're going to see on, uh, we'll see on Wednesday, Thursday of next week, uh, if they were right or not. Have you seen anything interesting out there in the term structure? I know it's been kind of bizarre of late what's been going on out there in VIX term structure. Uh, it was pretty flat on the back end and kind of sort of real steep forward. Um, and that's, that's exactly why we're, I mean, there's almost no variation between like August and December. Uh, it's less than, what is it, a buck and a half or something like that? It's really tight. Yet it is, you know, three and a half points over our May. So I think what this looks like is a market that is not as worried about the near term, but a little more worried about what, how we can move in the short term. And, and, that's, and that's ultimately what I feel. Um, and strangely enough is – Realize vol has gotten low again. So uh, the whole term structure feels like it's mispricing everything. But what are you going to do? That's what <laughs> we like. Nobody <laughs> wants to make that low sale. We basically. love mispricing. Uh, that's how it's kind of worked out. So it's it's not that, you know, volatility is never always right, which is why, of course, Don loves to sell it. But it is, I think, that, that near part of the term structure is uh, a fairly steep 
And it's just, I think, a function of the fact that people are having a hard time adjusting to uh, a 12 or, you know, 12 to 13 VIX for a long period of time. They can't quite do it yet. And I think that's why we're seeing that the steepness up front and then the flatness in the back. Because if, if the back end of the term structure was really steep as well, you know, you kind of have the curve going straight out, then you would, there would be more, uh, I think, a long-term, um, you know, sort of resistance in what, what the market could be doing. And the fact that it's kind of relatively flat means there's not a lot of worry in vol going super high in the short term. Uh, we'll get little dips maybe in pops in the short term, but nothing like the kind of earth-shattering uh, vol movers that we've had, let's say, in you know a good part of 2012. Um, we had three or four good shocks, and the market is not as worried about them, at least going through 2013, it looks like. All right. Thank you for that, Andrew. And that is going to do it for our volatility review segment. And now we're going to keep on rolling right on into the listener mailbag. Listener mail. Listeners write in. Listeners write in. All right, and welcome to the Listener Mailbag. This is, of course, one of my favorite parts of the show. This is where you, the listener, get your chance to join us here on the old program. And, Don, if you don't mind, I'm probably going to let you take the lead on most of these because my voice uh, probably couldn't make all of these questions, <laughs> even if I wanted to. Um, Not a problem. <laughs> so we're going to kick things off here with a question from Jackson Engels out of Garden City, New York. And he writes, when you're analyzing historical volatility, what time frame is most relevant past 30 days the past three months the past six months other etc what do you focus on in your analysis obviously don we've hit on this a little bit in the past different aspects of it i never i don't know if we've ever actually sat down and discussed uh, exactly what time frames we use the most uh so it might actually be an interesting discussion to kind of wrap it all up in here today about what time frames really really focus most in our analysis well, I think it is. And uh, very often when I'm doing my options seminars and we speak about uh, pricing options and looking forward and taking a look at uh, a one month option or a three month or a six month. And, you know, I challenge the uh, the, the students in the, the audience to take a look at uh, past historical charts of volatility, whether it be a stock or the S&P or another index and say, now you're you're on a trading desk and and maybe you've got a listed option or maybe you've got an over the counter option that that mimics one of these uh, indices and you've got to come up with an implied volatility you can't price the option until you put a volatility number into the black shoals model what number are you going to come up with and invariably i say to them look if this is a one month option does that mean that you just look at the past 30 days, you just look at the past month kind of with blinders on and you don't consider anything else? And most of them will say, well, no, gee, that may not be representative of, of the real overall volatility and what I can expect in the future. It might not have been a typical month. I'd certainly like to go back a little bit farther. So then, you know, you always carry it to the other extreme. You say, you think you ought to go back five years or look at 10 years worth of data? And then somebody will say, well, I don't see how uh, 10 years ago volatility is relevant for uh, pricing this option that's going to expire a month from now. And, you know, eventually we, we evolve into uh, a conclusion together that uh, matching the backward looking tenor to the forward looking expiration is probably not adequate. If I'm pricing a one month option, I can't just look at the past month and say that's all I need to know. If I'm pricing a six month option, I can't go back to previous six month volatility and say that's going to tell me the whole story. So the first uh, concept that, that I would throw in there is that no matter what the forward looking tenor of the option, you want to go back in time somewhat longer than that to give you a picture that's going to include a time frame that's sufficiently long enough to have allowed you to consider things that may have happened beyond the the matching time frame from going forward. Now, having said that, 
I believe that it's pretty logical to state that you ought to probably consider the recent past with a little bit more importance and weight than going back farther. And, and that, in fact, is the principle behind all arch, garch, t-garch, any type of modeling of volatility prediction that uses historical volatility. They look back, perhaps even farther than, than I might be comfortable with, but in so doing, they don't attach the same weight, and that certainly seems logical to me. I hope it does to our listeners as well. They don't attach the same weight to volatility a year or two or three years ago than they would to the recent past. And so it might be fun to actually go on our website, volex.us, and take a look at that chart or that array that I'm constantly referring to under data and then real vol indices and then choose current. And then you have the backward looking historical vol for a, a quite a large array of assets. And then you have the forward looking forecast of Robert Engel's group at the Volatility Institute. And what you should see there is that the forward looking forecast is not going to always match the backward looking tenor, but it's going to look fairly close to it because it's that backward looking matching time period that is given the greatest amount of weight. And so that's the, the answer to the question. And it, it, it may not be a, a scientific one. You'd have to turn to the, the Garch models to see the actual math of it. But intuitively, that's, that's the way I would construct it. Um, I guess a final comment might be, uh, I've often alluded to weather uh, analogies when talking about volatility, if you've had a heat wave the past five days and the temperature has been 100 every day and somebody says, uh, guess what the average temperature is going to be for the next two weeks or so, I might not guess 100, but, you know, I'm surely not going to guess 70 either. And so the recent past is extremely important, but you want to go back a little bit farther anyway, just to get a taste for what uh, the, the more average numbers are. And then what you want to do is you want to consider that average, which might be 75 or 80, but you want to weight the fact that, my gosh, we've had 100 degrees for the last five days. And then you don't want to say something that, that's higher than the average, but you're not just going to mimic the extreme and say for the next two weeks, we're going to have 100 every day. It's, it's a similar concept when you talk about volatility. Thank you for that, Don. Gave my voice a nice little rest, so um, I'm ready to go for reading the next question here. And the next one actually is, is somewhat scarily prescient. <laughs> it's a question from Timothy Van Allen out of Baltimore, Maryland, and he writes, I hope Mark didn't lose the voice of options at his unusual activity event. Boy, he got that wow. right, huh? He must have been there. I don't know. I don't remember some of them in Baltimore, but that's that's scary. Uh, but yes, I did. Too, your concern comes a little bit too late, Timothy. I should have talked to you earlier. Maybe I would have uh, listened, taken your counsel and, and not lost my voice, but... He goes on to say, I couldn't make that one, but I, but <clears throat> if you guys end up doing a Volviews 100 live, I hope to be able to attend. Well, we hope to be able to make that happen for you there, Mr. Van Allen. Uh, he goes on, my question has to do with vol skew. We hear a lot about the volatility smile, but nothing really exhibits it. Can you guys think of any underlyings that really spike from a volatility perspective once they move away from at the money in either direction? Uh, it's an interesting question. Of course, we've hit on, hit on the different shapes of skew in the past. Uh, we've talked a lot on recent shows as well about uh, things that spike to the upside, the kind of inverse of investment skew. Uh, you know, investment skew, obviously, traditionally, the curve slopes down once you get above the at-the-money strike implied volatility increase, I'm sorry, decreases in the call wing, whereas in a lot of the commodities, gold, what have you, that tends to spike to the upside, corn, places where uh, the, the price movement to the upside is the, is the true concern. That's where all the hedging uh, activity takes place. Uh, so a lot of them have that spike to the upside. But he's right, it, it, finding that true smile that everyone talks about in the book uh, is actually a little bit more difficult prospect these days. Uh, there aren't too many pro uh, products that really exhibit it. 
I know in a lot of cases, uh, some energy products will exhibit this. Some er places that are very tightly regulated, some markets, they will exhibit that increase of volatility uh, to the upside and the downside, uh, depending which way they move in an exaggerated fashion. So that's one of the ones I've seen recently. I know, Don, you probably have a few examples as well. The classic ones actually happen to be in foreign exchange, in, in FX. And so uh, the question said, we hear a lot about the volatility smile, but nothing really exhibits it. So that's not really quite true. And if, if you take a look at the, the currency pairs, and it's kind of logical to assume that, whether you're looking at the uh, dollar yen, and I think we, we have scheduled a question on that, or euro uh, dollar, or whatever the case may be, there, what you're really seeing is whichever of the two currencies may spike with respect to the other one, causing it to go down or to go up uh, with, with a great deal of volatility. You, you have the increase in prices uh, of uh, implied volatility pricing of the options. And so those skews, if, if you want to call them that, are really the traditional and classic smiles. Uh, they definitely go up symmetrically in both directions from the, the at the money. And I think that in, in all of the uh, realm of the various assets, it's uh, foreign exchange that comes closest to exhibiting what used to be the equity smile as well. I mean, we, we kind of have lost the term of smile, used to be called that for a long time, because you did have the upward turn on both sides, above and below the at the money. And as I often joked, but it is both figuratively and literally true, the crash of October 1987 wiped the smile off the face of uh, the, the equity uh, curve uh, seemingly forever. So we lost it there, but it, it still is exhibited in, in the FX implied volatilities. Ah, uh, yes, back in the good old days when we, we graphed a smile but didn't really have the data to back it up. And then all of a sudden we saw the real data coming in. We said, wait a minute. That isn't too accurate. <laughs> Let's maybe change that. Uh, so, yeah, the, the good old days of 1987 when it woke everyone up to say, wait a minute, all these graphs we've been drawing for all these years, they're, they're kind of just guesstimations to the upside uh, and to the downside, it turned out as well. Um, <clears throat> interesting question there, Mr. Timothy Van Allen from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and, of course, because we were just talking about FX, this next question follows suit very nicely. It's a question from uh, ATL16. Maybe he's right out of Atlanta. Uh, he says, dollar yen is crazy lately. What's a good source for FX vol info or analysis or a good FX vol tool? Um, Don, I know you guys have a lot of tools over there on volx.us. Do you do much with the currencies over there? Well, we do. As a matter of fact, you know, we're very uh, equity based on the show and we spend a lot of time talking about S&P and VIX and NASDAQ and what have you. But we're kind of an equal asset uh, uh, employer on our website. And if you do go to volex.us, we, we do have uh, tremendous historical data and analytical tools, and they cover all of the assets that we cover. So surely, yes, you do have equity where we've got uh, two, four, six, eight, about 10 uh, different indices. And then we go to about a half a dozen commodities, but then we have a half a dozen currencies as well. And so uh, one of them certainly is the Japanese yen, along with the Australian dollar, the British pound, the Canadian dollar, the euro, and the Swiss franc. And so for all of those, and uh, including the yen that our uh, listener is asking about, we provide uh, the historical data one month, three month, and 12 month uh, rolling averages. We provide the forecasts from the Volatility Institute and Robert Engel. But then when you go into the charting packages, we have a great deal of interactive history going back, uh, in some cases, 10 and 20 years, where you can create the graphs for the historical volatility, the volatility of volatility, 
And if you go into the drop down menu under data and then real vol indices, you will also find that we've got historical data that you can dump uh, and, and then uh, download and have that for analytical purposes. And we have our good old realized volatility cones that allow you to make probabilistic type analyses having to do with what percentile the current volatility is. 10% of the time, three month vol has been lower than this. 40% of the time, one month vol has been higher than this, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, not only for the yen, which was what the question was about, but for about 10 equities, a half a dozen commodities, a half a dozen currencies, and uh, interest rates for the Japanese government 10-year uh, 10, 10 bond futures and U.S. 10-year T-notes, uh, we, we've got an awful lot of data on the website. That's interesting. I didn't know you had so much on all the other currencies. I knew, of course, you had the euro because our listeners may not be aware, but of course you have the, the listed euro product over there on the CME. Right. And uh, so, of course, you have the data to back that up. But I didn't know you had expanded that universe into the yen and all these other FX products. So there you go, listeners. You can just go over to volx.us and get a lot of that great data uh, on the FX realm, which is becoming a, a, a hot area right now. Of course, everyone saw that dollar hitting 100 yen for the first time in, in ages uh, last week, I believe it was. So that got a lot of headlines, and I think it woke up a lot of people to, hey, there's some activity out there in that currency landscape. Maybe I should check it out. Next up, we have a question from Phil Thomas. Coming to us from the other London, London, Ontario. It's got to be rough, Don, living in London, Ontario, because you tell people, I live in London, they get all excited. Why well, you live in London? <laughs> then you say, oh, you know, London, Ontario. It's kind of like, like living uh, kind of like, like living in Paris, Iowa or something. You I know? was just going to say, like, Paris, Texas. Like, <laughs> it's <in> Paris, Texas. <laughs> Something along those lines. People get all excited and they say, oh, okay. But um, I'm sure London, Ontario is a lovely town. I've never been there. But just kind of uh, struck me as, as funny. Uh, he goes on to write, in what conditions <clears throat> would the Vol Squad ever consider... I like that, the Vol Squad. <laughs> well, what conditions would the Vol Squad ever consider using upside VXX or VIX calls slash verticals as a portfolio hedge? Or would you always stick with the good old S&P put spread slash ratio spread? <clears throat> I'll give my two cents first because right now my, my voice the way it is, I can probably only give two cents. Um, but my answer to this, Phil, I, th I think I've hit on this before on the show, is I, I really don't uh, and really wouldn't consider a VXX or VIX upside calls as a hedge that often. You know, I, we've talked to a lot of people. I've talked to a lot of people who've tried to convince me otherwise. They try to show me data showing how the VIX calls outperform in these dramatic, quote unquote, black swan scenarios. And that that's true. They do. In those scenarios, they certainly do outperform any sort of direct put spread by orders of magnitude. The problem is everything else in between. There's a lot of carry period where you're just carrying these calls, you're carrying these verticals, and they're just eroding to nothing, eroding to nothing over and over again. So if I had some magic crystal ball where I could somehow say, this is the black swan moment, then I would load it up. And if, of course, if something did start occurring in the marketplace where the market seemed like it was dropping precipitously, I was able to spot that ahead of time and be able to not only have my put spread on, but perhaps add a VIX call kicker or a VIX upside vertical kicker uh, before the rest of the masses got in and bid that vertical out of control or bid that upside in the VIX calls out of control, which certainly does happen quite quickly. You have to be kind of quick on the trigger finger on those. Uh, then I would consider adding it as a kicker. But I, I, I still can't envision a scenario where I just go all all volatility upside for my hedge that does that doesn't uh, at least not in these implied products as they exist right now they don't really float my boat don i'm thinking you have a, a similar viewpoint on that yes i happen to agree with everything you've said and i think that if we had uh, andrew or uh, mark sebastian here they, they they probably all would concur i just make a quick observation because at the end of the question our listener says, uh, or would you always stick with the good old S&P put spread or ratio spread? Just want to be careful uh, if you truly did mean ratio spread and, and not a back spread, because when you are long equities and you're considering a hedge, uh, obviously what you mean is that uh, if the market drops, uh, you're, you're going to be covered. You're going to be making money with your position. And surely that's not always the case with a ratio spread if, if what the questioner meant was own uh, one put 
at the closer to the at the money strike and sell some multiple of that, such as two with the father out of the money so that you, you could be net short uh, a put. You'd have one naked put there. So if, if things fall apart and the market drops precipitously, uh, that's not going to do you any good as a hedge. And in fact, it very well may lose you money. The opposite of that would be a backspread with a put where you would obviously own the two farther puts and being short the nearer term. That's like flipping the risk reward profile upside down. And in that case, if the market really fell apart, then such a spread would make you money and would act as a hedge against what you're losing with your equity position. So just a little clarification there. And those sounds of keys clacking mean listeners that we are joined in the old mailbag segment by good old Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Andrew. Of course, we had you on earlier in our vol review segment. I'm glad you could join us again. Um, really quick, Andrew, you may have missed the question we were just discussing, uh, but we had a listener write in and say, in what conditions would the Vol Squad ever consider using upside VXX or VIX calls slash verticals as a portfolio hedge, or would you always stick with a good old S&P put spread slash ratio spread? Don and I have already given our answers. Really quick, what would you say to our friend, Mr. Phil Thomas here from London, Ontario on this? Well, actually, because I was clicking, trying to pull up the mail, <laughs> but uh, the only time, let's see, consider using upside VXX. One is we only really create, uh, let's say, butterflies with them. The trades in general are very short term. Uh, when we think uh, that VIX cash relative to the future looks very cheap. And I know Don will be going like roll his eyes, but uh, those kind of trades we like when we think volatility is going to move a lot. We just kind of don't know what direction. So I basically would buy a VIX put and a VIX butterfly, call butterfly for the upside, and then trade the resulting piece like that. So as a pure portfolio hedge, they're tough. The VXX probably almost never because it is so unreliable unless it's very short term. That would be the only way I consider it would be like a short term, uh, a, sh a short term trade. Nothing like a, like a long term trade, I guess. I believe predict predictably crappy is the term you use for uh, for <laughs> VXX on a regular basis. It it, I, it is, and it's just I, I I can't recommend anybody actually buying it like that. I, there are some some interesting flies you can do in them at, at particular times, but that's really about it. And that's when I think the vol is just underpriced and it's just going to jump. I would not call that a portfolio hedge. That would be more like a just basically I want to buy some Vega and that looks like the cheapest way to do it. All right, Mr. Andrew, since you just jumped on, jumped on we'll give you a first crack at this last one here. It's an interesting one, a little bit of a perhaps a thought question. It's very general. Uh, it's a question from Mr. Pop. I love these handles. He writes, quick question. What is your favorite position for trading volatility? So there you go, Mr. Andrew. I'll toss it to you first to give my voice a little bit of a break. Uh, what uh, What is your favorite position for trading volatility of the entire landscape out there? What do you the go back to? Uh, most money in the next uh, yeah. two days. <laughs> the next 20 minutes. <laughs> I have to I have to say uh, my favorite position really is using the volatility products. I I like the VXX when the uh, VIX futures are coming out of backwardation into contango because I think it's going to fall apart the fastest. And on the upside, if I think I have a vol play upside when I have a relatively when uh, let's say VIX is relatively cheap, you know, like a call spread or a fly on the upside in the VIX. I don't really ever, almost never use the VXX for an upside play. But my third favorite would be to backspread volatility when I think it's going to move uh, short term when the future is trading really close to the cash, um, where you basically have a good shot at, you know, uh, the VIX moving a point, point and a half either way, but they're kind of underpricing the the at the money uh, straddle, if you will, and volatility. So in general, I just go right for the vol products uh, when I want to trade volatility, and that's the way I do it. Don, what say you, sir? 
Well, I guess you know my answer. So uh, my <laughs> classical favorite volatility trading position has always been uh, the relatively short term, one month or two month, slightly out of the money, five, ten percent short strangle, selling puts below the current market, selling calls above the current market. And I've touched upon this more than once. Most traders would say to you that they would only be comfortable trading such a position if implied volatilities were relatively high with respect to historical levels. And that might be the case if you are going to delta neutral hedge to zero every night, but it really wasn't the way that I traded. And so I let these positions run a little bit. I wasn't terribly uncomfortable if my deltas were a little out of whack to either side, long or short, because in my 10 plus years on the trading desk, I saw so many instances where you'd make an adjustment, uh, what turned out to be prematurely only to see the market reverse and snap back and go in the other direction and kind of said to yourself, you know, why did I do that? And the toughest part with trading such a position is, is learning to control your emotions and sitting on your hands and doing nothing until you really sense that there's some sort of urgency and you, you need to take action. But, you know, listeners know my mantra that options trade at implied volatilities that are historically higher than what the underlying goes on to display with realized volatility. So one way to capture that differential is to sell implied volatility and uh, hope that the market trades within a reasonable range of the strike prices that you choose. And that can happen in any kind of an environment, be it high or low implied volatility. So the fact that the market would be in a low volatility environment never really stopped me from selling implied volatility because if we stayed within the trading range of the two strike prices, those both options go to zero anyway. So that that was my outlook. I, I, I agree a little bit with Andrew. I, I like, uh, I, or I should say I don't like the VXX, but I also not a big fan of the VIX either. So I don't really trade VIX too often. So I'm not a big uh, VIX, uh, VIX trader in of itself. I like a good strangle, Don, particularly a nice good short strangle. Uh, but I find myself quite often these days being much more of a skew trader, and I like a good risk reversal. I don't know why I've gravitated towards that so much uh, in my uh, in my recent uh, trading days, but I, I love to trade some a nice, good, bullish, bearish, whatever the case may be, risk reversal, whatever the scenario dictates. I know that's heresy to you, Don, because there's a, a buying component involved, but I usually try to, at least Andrew, you'll smile that I usually get it, get my juice for free or sometimes a credit, so well, you'll I, like that. I like, I, like, I like half of your risk reversal. <laughs> <laughs> why, why does that not surprise me <laughs> you're half a genius and half a madman is what he's saying to me well exactly he's like well you know i don't really like the market and i don't like buying options so i i can't do that <laughs> <laughs> all right and before we get into a heated debate on the merits of buying and selling let's keep on rolling right on into our final segment the crystal ball and now we take a look at the crystal ball All right, and welcome to the Crystal Ball segment. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we peer into the murky ether from a volatility perspective and attempt to try to figure out what's going on in there and see what the old volatility gods, as fickle as they may be, what they have in store for us for the coming week. And Don, we'll start with you. What are you, What is your Crystal Ball telling you for the land of NASDAQ vol for the coming week? I'm going to take a shot at you know, both NASDAQ and S&P together, at least from the realized volatility point of view. And uh, it's, it's possible for the Memorial Day weekend that we may not do a show 
next week. And so if that's the case, I'll even try to look out on, on a two-week horizon. Um, I actually think that if you take a look at some charts and you, you go back for at least the better part of the last year, we, we've really been in a tremendously tight range for realized volatility. If you go all the way back to last summer, we haven't seen a reading above about 17 or so. And, and we haven't seen anything much lower than about nine or eh, maybe a little bit lower, about seven or so. So, you know, we, we keep looking at these waves. If you take a look at a chart, you can almost trace from last fall. I see up, down once, twice, three, four, five times. I wish I could put this up on a screen and have everybody look with me, but you can look on our website. And we're, we're just kind of completing yet another one of these uh, down uh, as realized volatility plummets into the 10 handle. It looks to me like it could potentially have another point or two to go that way. So I wouldn't be surprised to see us in the 9 handle, but then inevitably it looks like it turns around. So that's a kind of a tricky forecast, but I'm going to go with a little bit lower over the next few days and then that climb back up to more like the 14 or 15 range, at, at least for a little while. All right. And Mr. Andrew, what say you on you, you can try either one if you like. You can obviously you want to do VIX, but if you want to delve into Nasdaq Vol Land, I don't have the voice left to stop you, sir. Well, that scares me because that that's <laughs> that's we fit a position like that in our pit report today. It's kind of similar to what Don thought fading the short term and buying the long term. <laughs> so when Don and I both agree, I don't know how good that is. I like it better when he. I'm doing the opposite of what he wants. Seems like if we both agree on something, then it can't happen. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, then the listeners better really be careful. Uh, <laughs> they're probably everything's going to explode next week. Um, uh, so that, anyway, I all I can say is, yeah, that I agree with Don on the, at least in the Q part. Uh, volatility in the VIX, I just realized volatility is low. And... I think at this point, it's something out of left field that nobody sees coming that's going to make it go higher. Um, there's still money coming into the market. And, you know, and as for the VIX, I think we're just about seeing 12. You know, we had the weekend effect came in hard uh, today, uh, taking the VIX down to 1226, uh, closing just above 13 yesterday. So. Uh, I still say more of the same for, you know, S&P 500 volatility, somewhere between 13 and 12, but probably leaning toward the lower end and the realized volatility still saying in the, uh, I, I think I was looking at the uh, two seconds ago was around eight vol. Um, so it would not surprise me at all if it continues to stay uh, to stay in those levels. Simple, simple as that. All right. Thank you for that, Andrew. And of course, that's all the time we have for this episode of Volatility Views. We want to thank all of you who've downloaded and streamed and subscribed to this show. And of course, all of you who wrote in today, a lot of great questions. Keep those coming. And before we check out, I just want to check in really quickly with my cohorts one more time to see what they have cooking in their necks of the woods. Don, anything new cooking over there at volax.us? Not a great deal. I hope we're not in the summer doldrums as early as the middle of May. So uh, hopefully things will pick up a little bit in the weeks to come. And Mr. Andrew, I know you guys over there at Option Pit just finished the big options insider, unusual activity extravaganza. Hopefully your voices aren't as shot as mine. But uh, what else is Yours is really shot. Yeah, my, shot, my, my voice is gone. So you know it was an epic event, like I was saying earlier, when I blow my voice out because I talk quite a bit. So <laughs> took some beating the, this past week, but it was good. Um, but um, you, what, I wish I could uh, hear more about it, but Mark's not even working today. Yes. He's, <laughs> he's, he's in process. So uh, we, we blew him out as well. Every, everyone got a, <laughs> got a thorough, uh, thorough workout at the, at the unusual activity forum. Uh, but what else, if anything is cooking over there in the land of the pit? 
Uh, well, we're actually giving a free webinar on May 22nd. If you go to the optionpit.com events page, uh, we're giving a webinar for why you need to take our gold course. It's free. Uh, also, as usual with our webinars, uh, well, hopefully usual, uh, there's some education in there. You learn stuff. Um, so if you like the Vol View show, uh, you want to have like a little deeper understanding about how market volatility works. That's what our gold course essentially teaches, and that's what we will be explaining in this free webinar on May 22nd. It's actually we already got a lot of signups for it, um, so uh, I can't guarantee you there will be space, but uh, we'll have to pay Mr. Go to Meeting more money to expand our meeting room. But uh, that's that is our event, and uh, I I think honestly that people will enjoy it, and they might actually get a couple things out of it, maybe even a couple of gold course subscribers. <laughs> I should just clarify for our listeners, of course, that as exciting as it would be, that is not a course about GLD and GLD options or the big futures and the futures options. No, no, that is the Option Pit Gold Level course. Uh, that is your instructional Thank level. You. <laughs> uh, I've had that conversation with Mark a couple of times, and it might be a wee bit confusing. You might get some guys flocking right, yes, in babe. thinking we they're going to hear about GLD option skew. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. When are you going to get to the GLD skew? They're going to be all over you. So. <laughs> I know. Hey, come on, you dummy. Can't you get there? Yeah, you're right. You're right. So, yes. Yes. Uh, the Gold Court course focuses on uh, market volatility, understanding how the model works, how to position. We also have most of the courses basically dedicated to a lot of the position course dedicated to uh, Don's mantra of you sell stuff. Um, we just like you to understand what you're selling when you sell it. And then finally, uh, uh, managing risk of, of, of said positions. So, and that's where, and that's what the event is. So check that out, optionpit.com. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, if you did miss the event this week, of course, we'll put together a nice little downloadable package on our site in the weeks to come. We don't know what format that will take yet, what that will include, but it will include the audio from the event. It will include the visuals from the event. It will include some video of the panels. It will also include some exclusive video interviews we shot at the event. So a lot of great stuff we're going to throw in there and put that all together for everybody who couldn't make it uh, to come to our site and uh, get some access to. So interesting stuff. Stay tuned for that. We'll have more information on when that's available. And hopefully next time you hear from me, listeners, my voice will have returned to its uh, golden voice of options normal level. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and on, on behalf of Andrew and Don and myself, we want to say thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time right here on Volatility Views. Thank you for listening to Volatility Views. Join us next week as we keep our listeners on the cutting edge of finance and risk management with lively topics relating to volatility. Volatility Views is brought to you by the Volatility Exchange. If you'd like to learn more about vol contracts, please visit www.volx.us. If you'd like to submit a question for the hosts, then surf over to www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum and post your question in the Volatility Views Forum. Questions can also be submitted via email at questions at theoptionsinsider.com or via Twitter at twitter.com slash options and twitter.com slash volx underscore info. Facebook users can submit their feedback via the Options Insider and Volatility Exchange Facebook pages. Voicemails are also welcome at 312-544-9356. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on Volatility Views. The views expressed on this program are not intended as investment advice and do not constitute an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any securities or other financial instruments and may not be relied upon in connection with the purchase or sale of any security or other financial instrument. The opinions presented on this program represent those of the speakers and do not reflect the views of either the Options Insider Incorporated or the Volex Group Corporation. The preceding program was a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.